Now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Radio Show. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you, Paul. That was a great start for today's show, and I think we've got an exciting one looking down the the program here. The agenda looks like a program that I wouldn't want to miss, so I'm going to stay for the whole half hour. Okay. Uh, First of all, we take great pride in, again, bringing you our slightly acclaimed Bob and Ray Public Service feature, Speaking Out. Uh, That's the portion of our program where we invite you listeners to call in with your opinion on some controversial issue of the day. Just pick up the phone and give us a ring because we're making our nationwide radio facilities available to you right now. You know, I'm sure that gesture puts us a head and shoulder above Albert Schweitzer and those other so-called humanitarians who thought they were hot stuff. Well, excuse me, Ray. I never heard anything about Albert Schweitzer to indicate he thought he was hot stuff. Well, of course, he did his thinking in German, so he probably used a different term. Hmm. But uh, that's beside the point. What I'm really saying is that it's very noble of us to give up part of our show just so the peasants can have a chance to spout off. Yes, so thank us. The light on our phone is starting to flash, and I guess that means we have today's first peasant on the line. Uh, Hello, would you give us your name, please? Yes. My name is Delicious Instant Oatmeal with all the yummy flavor of the real thing, Ackerman. Well, I've never heard of anybody with a name like that. Well, my mother was an American Indian, and they name their kids after the first thing the baby sees when it's born. I've heard that. Now, in my case, there was a box of instant oatmeal that the makers claimed had all the yummy flavor of the real thing, even though it didn't. Well, is that what you were called to discuss, instant oatmeal? No, I I calmed down about that years ago. Now I want to express the opinion that uh, good books cost too much. And there really should be some place where you can borrow them to read, you know, without having to buy them. Well, sir, I think that idea is already... Wait, 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 hear me out. This is not as silly as you think. You see, most of us don't have any use for a $20 book once we've finished it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we just had a public building someplace where they could store books, then a lot of people could take turns reading the same one. Sir, didn't you ever hear of a library? Well, I'll say... There's a great big one right down the street from where I grew up. My folks always warned that if I was bad, they'd take me down there and let the librarians throw me in one of the dungeons. Oh, I see. So you've never actually been in a library then? No, knock on wood. I was never bad enough to get taken there. But uh, why are you bringing that up now? Well, I don't know. It seemed pertinent, but maybe not. So let's move along to another caller here. Uh, let's try this line. Your name, please? Hello, I'm Mrs. Abraham Lincoln of Springfield, Illinois, and I think people around here should make an effort not to get so mixed up just because my husband has the same name as the President of the United States. The former President, you mean. I thought he was still in office. No, he isn't. Well, maybe that'll make it easier. At least my husband can stop calling himself Dishonest Abe just so people will know he's not the other one. Well, it's often hard to shed a nickname, but he can try while we move along to a final caller here. Your name, please. Hello, I'm Odie Larksfelder, and I live upstairs over that place where nobody lives downstairs anymore. All right. Uh, what's the opinion you'd like to express over the air, sir? Well, I have 26 ideas jotted down here. Well, the first. excuse me, sir. We, we don't have time for you to give us 26 opinions. Why don't you just pick one of them? Well, I can't do that. They're all connected. For instance, I think the members of the British royal family ought to go out on the road as a traveling softball team. But they can't uh, very well do that unless the monarchy is abolished, which is another one of my suggestions. Uh Uh-huh. You say all 26 of your ideas are dependent uh, on each other like that? Well, pretty much so, except for number 22. Of course, that's the one about stuffing pillows with penguin feathers to boost the economy of the Antarctica. I guess that could be done even if the British royal family doesn't play softball. Yeah, I agree. Hardly anything in the Antarctic has much bearing on the British royal family, but thanks for giving us your thoughtful views, and I think we've accomplished something here, don't you, Ray? Hope our listeners will be inspired to do the same on our next edition of Speaking Out. And 
And hello, sports fans. Again, it's time for Biff Burns Sports Room. Today, we're fortunate in having with us Charlie Brackley, the man who invented the huddle when he played football for Yardley University many years ago. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Biff, and hello to all the fans who remember me as the Galloping Cat. Uh, Charlie, or a galloping cat, whichever you prefer. Well, Charlie's all right, Biff, although to this day, people still walk up to me on the street and say, Hello, galloping cat. Uh Uh-huh. Now, Charlie, I'll bet very few listeners know that your number, 46, was retired after you hung up the cleats. No, people uh, still stop me on the street to tell me that old 46 isn't being used anymore at Yardley University. And would you tell our listeners just where that number was retired to, Charlie? Uh, It's enshrined in a glass case and Pendle Hall at the university, right next to the uh, deflated football that Bip Connolly kicked for a 64-yard field goal. I know. I visited Yardley University last year in time for the Bip Connolly once-a-year inflation of the ball ceremonies. It was uh, very moving. Well, uh, Yardley University is rife with tradition. Did you know that before each football game, the students stuffed dollar bills into Martin Egglesby's pocket? They do it for luck. Is uh, Martin Egglesby a statue on the campus? No, he's the registrar at Yardley University, and he's very alive and in evidence. I see. Now, Charlie, how did you invent the huddle? Well, we were playing Washington, D.C. University. All the Washington red tapes. That's right. And in those days, after a play, there was no huddle. The center passed the ball to whoever he felt like. And, of course, that's nothing like the scientific method used today. Right, Biff. No one on the team knew who was going to get the ball, and once you did get it, you could do anything you wanted. You could run, you could kick, pass... I favored running myself. And, of course, that's why you became known as the Galloping Cat. But was the huddle invented during that game, Charlie? Yes, it was just after a play where I'd been thrown for a substantial loss. The linesman thought I was going to toss a pass, so they all ran downfield. That kind of left you unprotected. Oh, sure did, Biff. The red tape 11 bore down on me, and I thought it best just to fall to the turf before they reached me. I understand, Charlie. Well, Biff, I neglected to mention that uh, falling to the turf meant nothing whatsoever to the red tapes. They all piled on anyway. And with all that sheer weight resting on you, I suppose there was some discomfort. A little, Biff. After they got off, some of the members of my team became curious, and uh, they gathered around me. That sounds like a huddle. Was it then that uh, you gave the team instructions on the next play? Yes, Biff. While I was lying there, I complained bitterly. I said, look, fellas, Charlie Brackley's mother didn't raise him to be a fool. Give the ball to somebody else on the next play. And who did the center snap the ball to on the next play? Bender Monahan. Now, he went in one direction, and his interference in another. He didn't stand a chance. I know. I saw Bender Monahan's broken helmet enshrined in glass in Pendle Hall. Right. But on that play, Biff, Bender Monahan had been advised as to the disposition of the ball. So, uh, don't you see? That was the first huddle. Right, Charlie. <laughs> And it wasn't until many years later, 1922 to be exact, when the Wyoming Cliff Dwellers decided it might be a good idea for all football personnel to go in the same direction on a play, that the huddle became popular. The circle quickly followed. Thank you, Charlie Brackley, for being with us today. Without you, things would never have been talked over properly in a football game. You're a gridiron great. And this is Biff Burns saying until next time, this is Biff Burns saying so long. Now it's a big moment on the old Bob and Ray show for all you culture fans. We're launching our newest highbrow feature today. It's called Prose and Poetry on Parade. Now during the weeks ahead, we'll be visiting with the authors of some current best-selling books. And to kick off the series, we have the very talented Rob Stonehenge here today. Rob, I'm sure you have the year's big hit here in your newest expose, All the President's Laundry. Well, thank you for those kind words, Ray. A lot of months of digging through the evidence went into this, and it's gratifying that so many readers uh, seem as interested in the subject as I was. Well, it's certainly a subject that uh, needed to be investigated. When did you first become interested in how our past presidents uh, did their laundry? Uh, It's a funny thing about that. I'd known ever since I was a school kid that John Adams was our first president to live in Washington, and I'd read the old story that his wife Abigail hung the family laundry on a clothesline beside the White House. But I never thought anything more about it at the time. 
Well, uh, many of us uh, who've heard that old story never think anything more of it at the time or even later, <laughs> come to think of it. Something caused you to probe deeper, Rob. What was it? Well, Ray, as you know, I'm a reporter covering the White House for the Omaha Press, Beacon Dispatch, and Morning Ledger. And one day, as I was going in for a briefing, it occurred to me that I'd never seen any laundry drying in the side yard of the mansion. But then I suppose it struck you right away that the president's clothes are probably now dried in, well, an electric dryer. No, even before I thought of that, it struck me that the White House probably sends its dirty clothes out to a professional laundry. Uh -huh. However, I staked out the building for several weeks, and no laundry trucks ever went in or out. Well, the chapters in your book about that uh, laundry truck stakeout are fascinating to read, I'm sure. Does that mean you haven't read them yourself? No, but uh, I'm planning to quite soon. So uh, what did you do once you learned that the first family doesn't send us clothing to the laundry? I began chatting with the old-time correspondents at the White House. For instance, I talked at some length with Bingham Horchison. Huh? He's covered every president since Herbert Hoover for the weekly editorial companion. I didn't know that magazine was still being published. It isn't. It went broke years ago. But Bingham Horchison still hangs around the White House press room. He's the dean of correspondence there, and... I figured if anybody knew how the president gets his laundry done, Bingham would be the man. And uh, was he uh, any help? Well, he provided a lot of good background material and I was able to use in the book. He reminded me that Hoover wore celluloid collars, which never would have required laundering at all. Well, uh, that was another small piece that fit into the overall puzzle, huh? Yes, but it was only a partial explanation. And the mystery deepened when Bingham Horchison and I started discussing President James Buchanan. Uh -huh. Of course, we hadn't been around in those days, but we knew that Buchanan was our long bachelor president. So that made it even more puzzling as to how he got his laundry done. <laughs> Could he have had a woman come in one day a week or something like that? Well, that had to be regarded as a possibility, so Bingham went over to the National Archives and hunted for any mention of a laundress who came to the White House regularly between 18 and 56 and 18 and 60. And I suppose uh, Bingham Horchison had plenty of time to help you with that since the magazine he works for isn't published anymore. That's right. However, he couldn't find anything at all about a person coming in to do the White House laundry during Buchanan's administration. Uh -huh. Later, Bingham and I went through a lot more documents for every administration from Madison through Eisenhower. And we never found a cleaning ticket, a laundry tag, nothing. Well, that's amazing. Well, one considers the many different types of clothing made out of different fabrics that were worn during that very long period. Yes, I have a chapter in the book on that entitled Laundering Instructions Through the Years. I see. So tell me, what finally led you to the real inside story of how our presidents have gotten their laundry done? Well, I'm afraid your listeners will have to read the book to find that out. I don't want to give away the ending. Fair enough. So uh, thanks for joining us today. We've been chatting with Rob Stonehenge, author of the sensational expose, All the President's Laundry. And we invite those of you at home to join us for another illuminating discussion on our next edition of Prose and Poetry on Parade. Now come with us again as we journey to Garish Summit and its endless tales of intrigue among the socially prominent. There in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our action resumes, wealthy dowager Agatha Murchfield is in the downstairs conversation pit when her attorney and longtime friend, Bowden Pardew, enters. She rises to greet him and speaks. Don't come a step closer or I'll blow your head off. This Roscoe's loaded and I know how to use it. Agatha, for goodness sake, put that gun away. Oh, I'm sorry, Bowden. I didn't recognize you in that argyle sweater with the plaid knickers. I... Naturally assume that anyone dressed that way would be a member of the criminal element. No, it's just that your urgent message reached me at our cottage down by the lake. 
I dress strictly for comfort there. Well, I'm glad you didn't take time to change because I have a major legal problem with far-reaching financial consequences. It's only a small cottage and the lake isn't really fashionable anymore, but I feel I can relax there. The police have been searching for my wayward son Caldwell ever since I discovered he was embezzling from the family business. Now I find that he's still writing checks on our joint personal account. Every year, Myrtle suggests that we sell the cottage and buy a place in the mountains, but I I wouldn't be comfortable there. My word, Bowden, you haven't heard a thing I've said. Of course I have, Agatha. I was merely exchanging pleasantries. Now, was there anything in particular you wanted to see me about? Certainly. Caldwell is hiding somewhere in Bolivia, and he's writing large checks every day on our joint account, so I want you to go down to the bank immediately and stop payment. You want me to go to the garish summit mercantile and millionaire's bank wearing an argyle sweater with plaid knickers? I don't care what you wear. Just stop those checks. I can't imagine why we're dawdling around this way. I'm just trying to envision why anyone would need such a large amount of money to live well in Bolivia. Well, there it is, Slick. A 45-room villa with a view of the Andes. And I picked it up for only two million bucks. Well, it may be a bargain, Caldwell, but I thought we were just laying low here in Bolivia until the cops get off your trail. Why do we need a mansion for a hangout? Ah, uh, there's been a change in plan, Slick. I'm sending you on alone. I'll be staying here for a rendezvous with my brother's ravishingly beautiful secretary, Pamela. I thought Pamela and your brother Rodney were going to be married. Uh, that's what Rodney thought, too, but uh, I've spoken with Pamela, and once she heard about this 45-room villa... As he decided to come here and marry me instead. I can just imagine what Rodney will say when he finds out he's lost another round to his big brother. I scarcely know what to say, Pamela. Having you change your vacation to next week is quite inconvenient. That's when we have to take an inventory of all the lead ingots in the warehouse. Well, that's tough toenails, Rodney. Caldwell phoned me last night from Bolivia. We were chatting about all the millions he embezzled from the company here, and when he asked me to come down and marry him, I impulsively said yes. Well, that relieves me of one chore I had on my calendar for next week, reserving the church for our own wedding. I'm glad you're taking it so well, Rodney. Actually, I'm not taking it well at all, Pamela. Inside, I'm a seething cauldron of emotions. Well, it's nice to know you care that much. I care a great deal. Caldwell has filched money from this company. Now he thinks he can steal my fiance too. But I'll track him to the ends of the earth. And if you're with him when I find him, you'll be arrested as his accomplice in crime. You may rest assured of that. Can Caldwell continue to maintain a low profile while he stages a formal wedding at the largest villa in Bolivia? And Bowden Pardew continue to enjoy respect after he appears at the bank in an argyle sweater with plaid knickers. And what about the sudden surprise inventory at the lead warehouse? Join us next time when we'll hear Rodney say... 567, 568, 569. Just as I suspected, we're 75,000 ingots short. That's in our next exciting visit to Gary Summit. Now, through the magic of live radio, we again join Folly Gerard in a remote corner of America as he continues his travels down the byways. Today, Farley has parked his luxurious motorhome in Alcorn, Kentucky, where he's set to bring us another of his homespun reports. So come in, please, Folly Gerard. Older Americans can well remember when this country's belief in freedom of the press was symbolized by the small-town print shop. There, the pungent smell of fresh printing ink was always in the air, and the old cast-iron press ground out the weekly newspaper for all to read. Now the word processor and the electric copying machine have generally taken away the printer's craft, but here in Elkhorn, Kentucky, there's still one man who loves to see hand-set type making its imprint on clean white paper. His name is Medrick Slade, He's proud to call himself an old-fashioned journeyman printer. 
Actually, I'm a master printer, not a journeyman, but uh, I'd be proud to call myself either one. Well, Mr. Slade, standing here in your musty little shop, I feel as though I've taken a step backward through time. A lot of tourists who come here say that. Of course, they don't say it as poetically as you do. But I think they feel it. Well, your shop is truly like a lost scene out of my boyhood, with the big wooden type cases along one wall, and what are those cartons on the other side over there? Now, those are filled with hand-etched steel engravings of the kind that were used on fancy official documents years ago. We mean like old land deeds and things like that. Yes. Also, I have some engravings out of uh, locomotives and factory buildings that were used to print stock certificates for companies that no longer exist. And uh, there are also some very fine etchings of U.S. presidents that we used on our early currency. Well, you're preserving some valuable mementos of our American heritage here, and you were telling me before we went on the air that you still crank up that old flywheel press to run off replicas of beautiful old documents. That's right. Collectors love fine, quality, hand-printed work that's seldom seen anymore, so I use my original equipment to print replicas of old documents for them. For example... Now, here's an exact copy of one of the bonds that was issued in 1810 to finance the Wabash and Erie Canal. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Now, over here, I have a reproduction of a stock certificate for a wagon company printed in 1844. Look, here's a replica of an old $1 bill like they used in 1963. I thought it was illegal to print copies of currency that look just like the money still in use today. Oh, this doesn't look much like a modern bill at all. You see the signature of the Secretary of the Treasury down there in the corner? That guy hasn't been in office for 20 years. Uh Uh-huh. And how else does this replica of yours differ from the real money that's being issued by the Treasury today? Well, that's the main difference, just the signature. I see. But collectors I deal with are trying to notice uh, that difference right away. In fact, I sold my whole stock of this particular design to a well-known collector just before you came in. You sold your whole stock to one person? How many copies? 200,000. I guess he wanted some extra to take home to his friends and fellow collectors. He was from Las Vegas. Are you saying you sold $200,000 worth of counterfeit money to one customer and you still don't see anything illegal about that? Well, I'd prefer that you didn't use the word counterfeit to describe my work. There are a number of artisans like me who print replicas of old documents. And listen, we're a highly respected group. Well, I admire your talent as much as the next person. I'm just surprised the Secret Service hasn't been around to... Oh, the feds don't get down this way very often. Well, after this interview, I imagine they soon will. But in the meantime, I congratulate you on the lovely work you do here. Thank you. I also make replicas of old treasury bonds that several collectors have been able to redeem at a Chicago bank for a thousand bucks apiece. I think that speaks well for my craftsmanship. Indeed it does. And the look of pride on your face is truly one of a master printer who takes satisfaction in a job well done. It's a look that isn't often seen today on the faces of workers in our big cities. Here in Alcorn, Kentucky, the pace is more leisurely, and the quality of the work shows the love that went into it. The love of a man named Medrick Slade. We'll remember him as we move along to listen to other stories waiting to be told down the byways. Until our next stop, this is Farley Gerard saying so long for now. And now, the United States Mint, one of the nation's leading producers of fine new money, presents another dramatic story from the files of the Emergency Ward. Greetings and welcome. I'm Dr. Gerhard Snutton, handsome young physician who's not yet established a practice of his own. Instead, I work in the emergency ward of a big city hospital. The emergency ward is a place where the drama of human suffering is an everyday occurrence. Take the other evening, for example. I was on a short break checking my latest medical experiment when my assistant nurse, Rudhouse, turned to me and said, Why are you just sitting there staring at that colony of ants, doctor? I believe I'm on the brink of a great medical discovery, nurse, Rudhouse. Notice how these ants can carry burdens that are larger than their own bodies? Imagine what a human being could do if I merely restructured his vertebrae like that of an ant. Well, I think you'd also have to give him eight legs if he's going to get enough leverage to 
drag 500-pound breadcrumbs. I consider that, but I'm afraid it's not practical. Rebuilding a person's backbone to make it more like that of an ant would involve less surgery. Oh, pardon me. Is this the emergency ward or Rick City Hospital? Yes, and I'm Dr. Gerhard Snutton, handsome young physician who's not yet established a practice of his own. Uh, please stop mumbling and state your business. Where's the best I can talk, Doc? I got a Parker House roll stuck in my cheek. Oh, I see. I see the swelling now. That's most unfortunate. Mumps can be a serious illness for a man your age. Doctor, I don't believe he mentioned anything about mumps. I think he said he has a Parker House roll stuck in his cheek. Nurse Roothouse, I've asked you not to interfere when I'm in consultation with a patient. He's right, Doc. It's a Parker House roll. Somebody hit my elbow while I was eating, and I got jam on my cheek. Well, try not to get too panicky. Some adults with mumps have been known to pull through. Doctor, he's not saying a word about mumps. He's telling you that a lump in his cheek there is a Parker House roll. Nurse Roothouse, I'm a medical school graduate, and I certainly couldn't have won my diploma without being able to understand simple English. He has the classic symptoms of mumps, and he's merely trying to tell me about them. Excuse me, or if you're going to fight with her for a while, I'll just take a walk down the hall. Yes, I'm sure the pain is excruciating, but don't worry, old fellow. I'll do my best to save you. Don't slap him on the back, Doctor. That could be dangerous. Oh, for once, I think you were right, Nurse Rudhouse. His dentures flew clear across the room when I hit him. Uh, those weren't dentures, Doc. It was the Parker House roll stuck on my cheek. I guess slapping me on the back jotted it loose and made it fly out. Well, that's not surprising. I slap newborn babies on the back for much the same reason. Except that they haven't been eating Parker House rolls. Well, I've never studied up on those medical technicalities, but uh, it sure worked in my case. What do I owe you, Doc? Well, for doing the same thing in a maternity case, I get $150, but you took up less of my time, so let's say three bucks. Hey, that's a real bargain. Hey, Arn, thanks. Goodbye. Well, Nurse Roothouse, medical science has again worked its wonders to save a human life when all hope was gone. So you may simply enter the notation in your case book, Patient Released, Cured. And so another tragedy is miraculously averted, thanks to the dedicated men and women who toil in a big city hospital. Join us again soon when the United States Mint producer of Fine New Money, will bring you still more tense drama from the files of The Emergency Ward. And as we say in the movie business, that's a wrap for this Bob and Ray show. It was developed and produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson who still maintains he gave his best film performance in Citizen Kane. His associate producer, Lars Howell, still insists he's never seen any of the movies he's made. Paul Taubman provided our music. Sound by Al Schaefer, who also played the part of the old gaffer. Technical director was David Glasser. Engineering assistants were Marty Newman, Miles Smith, and Jay Newland. Production assistants, Bill O'Neill and Charles Whitson. And the entire program was recorded at Howard Schwartz Studios in New York. Howard was also the best boy. Funding provided by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through NPR's Satellite Program Development Fund and from public radio stations. And now this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. Again, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. We regret that we cannot send a picture without a stamped self-addressed envelope. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation. And now, from approximately coast to coast, Bob and Ray take great pleasure in presenting the Bob and Ray Radio Show. Hey, it's your Bob and Ray. Yeah, right. wait just a minute. But, uh, uh, did you notice my foot slipped a little there? Uh, I know. Was that your foot or your, your hand? No, um, it, was, it was my foot. Now do, I, do that a note again, will you? What I'm going to do 
It, no. That's what I'm going to do is cut up some old radial tires. Yeah. And I'm going to stick them on the pedals here so my foot won't slip. I noticed that, or else yeah. you could use your stocking feet. Uh huh. Oh no, Can they you... they slip. They will slip. slip. No, you got to use have heavy traction. On the on the pedals of these organs. A lot of people. I'm sorry for that. Did I ruin your a, program? No, no, there's no <laughs> way you could do that. I know you follow the so uh, particular. A little thing like that can well, ruin your show. Well, like a little grain of sand in the machinery. But that's we, right. We did want to introduce uh, Paul Talvin, who's back with us, as we have mentioned before, and of course, uh, our Mary Magoon will be along in the series to come, and Wally Blue of our staff is uh, on. Well, uh, assignment tonight. Right now, he's just checked in. Uh, checked in. <laughs> hey, oh, I guess you make mistakes too, yeah. huh? Uh, he's just checked in from uh, Lubeck, Maine. That's better, right? So, for an on the spot news report, we now go live and direct to Wally Ballou in Lubeck. Wally Ballou here on the shores of the Blue Atlantic in Lubeck, Maine. I'm on hand for the opening of the nation's newest airline, which began service just this morning, and I have the name of the uh, company here in my notes somewhere. The uh, name of it is the Lubeck and South Quaddy Airline, Mr. Below. According to my notes, it's called the Lubeck and South Quaddy Airline. And the voice you heard while I was obtaining that information belongs to the president of the line, Mr. Wallace Pumphrey. Mr. Pumphrey, I understand this new air service operates chiefly in the resort area right around Lubeck. That's right, Mr. Lowe. Specifically, uh, we've licensed, or I should say we're licensed, uh -huh. for uh, passenger runs between Lubeck and South Quaddy Island. Do I talk right into this microphone? Not right here. I'll hold it toward uh, you when you're supposed to talk. All right. Now, that's, uh, see, why our board of directors decided to name it the Lubeck and South Quaddy Airline. Well, it seems like a wise corporate decision. Just where is the South Quaddy Island from here, sir? Well, uh, you can see it right across the open stretch of water there. Our flights land between the Blue Cottage down on the far end uh -huh. and the white one off to your right there. Right. Well, that's just a sandbar, barely 100 yards offshore there. Well, actually, it's not quite that far. The distance uh, from our main terminal here in Lubeck over to the landing strip on South Quaddy Island is uh, just under 225 feet. You mean you operate an airline that covers a distance of only 225 feet? Yeah, but it's all open water between here and the island. I mean, a person can't walk there, and oh, no. boat service is slow. Uh-huh. So you're hoping that commuters will take one of your planes even that short distance, right? Yes, basically, yes. But uh, you've made one incorrect assumption. You see, we don't use planes. We send people back and forth on hang gliders. Well, I noticed several older people trying to keep a grip on hang gliders as they sailed off the point down there, but I didn't know they were passengers on the Lubeck and South Quaddy. Yes, you see, our ground crew pushes each ticket holder off that bluff, and if the traveler has any hang gliding skill at all, he comes down on the landing strip at South Quaddy. I see. Apparently, uh, most of your passengers don't have any hang gliding experience. That elderly woman just dropped like a rock. Yes, yeah, she did. But it's only about a 20-foot fall in the soft sand. Uh -huh. See, she's getting up now, brushing oh, yeah. herself off. Yeah, she's she, going to be all right. Don't okay. worry about it. No, of course, her suitcase flew open, and the contents are scattered over a wide area down there. Well, actually, a person uh, who's hang gliding shouldn't try to carry a suitcase, especially a beginner like that. That brings up an interesting point, Mr. Pumphrey. How do you talk older people into flying to the island by hang glider when they don't know how to do it? I hope uh, you aren't implying that we coerce them in some way. No, no, not at all. But it seems odd that a first-time hang glider would try to take off carrying a suitcase. That woman even appeared to be holding a martini glass between two fingers of her other hand. Well, that's possible. We offer a complimentary cocktail on all our flights to the island. Uh-huh. Well, it looks very dangerous. I still don't understand how you talk people into trying it. Beats me. I guess maybe the whole thing just takes them by surprise. You see, they buy tickets over in the terminal building. And then one of our flight attendants leads them out onto the bluff and tells them to hold a bar of a hang glider. Uh-huh. And then the ground crew pushes them off. And that's the first time they realize that they're not going by plane? That's right. We don't actually lie to them, but uh, they may just assume they're going by plane since we call ourselves an airline. Right. The average person might expect an airline to have planes. Well, I guess it could affect our repeat business after people wise up to what we're doing here, but so far we're handling more passenger traffic than we expected. Good. 
goes another one now. Uh -huh. Well-dressed businessman with the remains of his briefcase. So your service does indeed seem to be prospering, Mr. Pumphrey. And now from Lubeck, Maine, this is Wally Ballou sending it back to Bob and Ray in our main studio. And now it's time for another story of drama and tense emotion. A tale well designed to keep you in... Anxiety. And here with us again to set the stage for our latest thriller is the noted lecturer and world traveler, Commander Neville Putney. Commander, I presume that you've reached into your amazing file and brought forth another tale, well designed to keep us all in anxiety. Yes, indeed I have, young man, and like all the true stories I bring forth from my amazing file, this one involves a test of the human character, one might almost say a test designed by fate to discover the breaking point of those subjected to... Anxiety. This week's story centers around two grizzled gold prospectors who are making their way across the desert in the American West. One has struck it rich, while the other is returning to civilization penniless and defeated. As they pause in their trek across the burning sand, it's the wealthy prospector who turns and speaks. Dad dried it all anyhow. I swore there was a water hole right on this spot. Well, it ain't there no more. Oh, there's nothing but miles and miles of empty space twixt us and the assay office. Lucky you still got a canteen full of water. Mm. Otherwise, I I don't know as I could make it, uh, carrying all these bags of gold. I ain't uh, never been one to pry into another man's affairs, O.D., but how do you figure my water's going to help you get to the assay office with that gold? I reckon I know what you're getting at, but you want to trade your water for my gold. Well, here, take it. I'm going mad with thirst. <laughs> You're a fool to do this, Odie. You give me a million dollars worth of gold for a pint of water. Of course, these bags are a good deal heavier than I figured. Let's uh, trade back. I can make you a rich man. You're a fool to do this, Bart. You had a fortune in your hands, and you gave it away. But then I don't reckon I'm any better off than I was. Thirsty, with the bags to tote besides. <laughs> You're a fool to have done it, Odie. Uh, come to think of it, only one of us can leave here alive, and only one of us can have all that gold. And it can't never be the same man that does both. Wow! That had to be the most spine-tingling story you've ever told us, Commander. <laughs> but uh, you can't just leave us in anxiety this way. How did Bart and Oldie ever make a decision on which one should live and which one should be rich? Well, as it happened, they never had to make that terrible choice. They didn't know it at the time, but they were trudging through Zion National Park. So, of course, they soon found one of the drinking fountains that had been placed all about for the use of tourists. Drinking fountains? That's ridiculous. There weren't any drinking fountains in the desert in the Old West. I never mentioned when this amazing story took place, young man. Now that you've brought it up, the event transpired in either July or August of 1972. Hey, Commander, you just picked that unbelievable ending out of the air so you could get away with telling us another one of your dumb, pointless stories. Insolent young bounder. Every one of these true accounts has been brought forth from my amazing files. The only amazing thing about your file is that every story in it lays an egg. That's quite enough of your cheeky back talk. Now read the closing announcement and be quick about it. Well, after that, Dud, I sure feel like a complete fool doing this. But I guess I have to. Uh, friends, be sure to join us next time when Commander Putney will again reach into his amazing file and bring forth a tale well designed to keep you in anxiety. Thanks, Paul. You're doing great now that you've got those uh, <laughs> pieces of tire. On well, the, on I the get shoes. warmed up as we go along. Right. Now, what would you like to hear next? We've got a good many things here. How about speaking out? That's oh, I a, love that. That's a fine program feature. That it's a fine have. program feature, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. It's where we encourage the listener to phone in with their opinion on some controversial issue of the day. Right. Now, uh, I might add that this feature was seriously considered for a national award when we put it on the air a while back. Uh, actually, Ray, I don't think anyone but you thought it was being seriously considered for a national award. Well, I know. I considered it quite seriously. Oh, I did, too. And I decided that uh, we're doing a noble thing here, making our vast technical facilities available 
to any weirdo who wants to spout off about public issues. Yeah, well, I admit it does sound noble when you put it that way. And now I see that today's first call from one of those weirdos is coming in, so would you give us your name, please? I have the phone here. Yes, my name is Kareem Abdul Jabba. <laughs> you don't look like the same one I've heard about. How tall are you, sir? I'm five feet one, even though I'm really only 4'11". But if you're planning to make a bunch of short jokes at my expense, I'll just hang up no. right now. No, no, I didn't have anything like that in mind. Why don't you go ahead and uh, give us your opinion on the public issue you selected? Well, it's my opinion that the job of Prince of Wales should be a civil service position. The way it is now, a guy can spend years studying to be a prince, but then the guards at the palace gate just tell you that the job's filled. They don't expect any openings. Well, are you saying that you studied to be the Prince of Wales? Yes, and I must add that I probably could do a better job than the fellow they hired. I can ride in an open carriage and wave to the multitudes without bending my wrist at all. Well, in spite of that skill, I presume you're unable to find work, is that well, right? Well, uh, yeah. Last time there was an opening, I don't think they even looked at my application. And they certainly didn't invite me to the palace so I could show them how I always picked the right spoon to eat my soup. Uh -huh. Instead, they picked some other guy just because uh, the queen liked them. That's un-American. Well, I guess the British royal family does quite a few things that are un-American. But thanks for calling in to complain about it. And let's uh, chat with another caller here. Uh, your name, please. I'm Mrs. Trudy Gorbeck. I'm calling from Muscatine, Iowa. Ah, really? I've met a number of nice people from out that way, Miss Gorbach. Well, then you've never met my husband, Wendell C. Gorbach. He's a conniving little weasel who's probably stepping out with another woman on a regular basis. <laughs> you really shouldn't say things like that on the air, ma'am. Why don't you just uh, move along to the opinion about public affairs that you called in to give? Very well. It's my opinion that my husband, Wendell C. Gorbach, is stepping out with another woman... On a regular basis. Well, uh, look, uh, ma'am, I'm afraid you made the same slanderous statement again on national radio. I don't... Uh, don't you have an opinion about some other subject? This is very no, personal. No, I'm just too obsessed with my husband's shenanigans to think about anything well, else. His name is Wendell C. C. Gorbach. I heard his name, and I imagine every lawyer in Iowa has made a note of it, too. So let's quickly move along to one last quick call here. Your name, please? Uh, hi. I'm uh, Norman Heiser. I share a broom closet in a Detroit uh, hotel here with several other household appliances. All right. So are you a first-time caller, Wendell? Uh, uh, Norman, I mean. Yes, it is. A first-time caller. All but right. I'm a long-time listener. Good. What's I always the... wanted to call. I thought I'd be insulted by you guys. No, we don't do that sort okay. of thing. Well, uh, uh, What's the opinion you want to give? It's it? my opinion that the makers of my new car were lying when they said it was designed to get 33 miles at a gallon but that the uh, actual mileage will vary due to climate and driving conditions. Yeah, well, that does sound like a rather vague statement. With all those loopholes, how could they be lying, though? Very easily. I discovered that I always get exactly 33 miles to the gallon. Changes in climate don't affect it at all. How about driving conditions? No, I checked that out last summer. First, I drove at an even speed across Kansas, and then I deliberately got stuck in bumper to bumper traffic in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Didn't make any difference. I still got 33 miles to the gallon. Well, then it seems the manufacturer's statement is certainly untrue. So thanks for telling us about it. And we hope to uncover something equally deceptive next time when we'll invite our listeners to take part in another session of Speaking Out. <laughs> Hi, this is Turnley Gebhardt, your face is in the news reporter, and we have a gentleman with us uh, today who had his face in the newspaper yesterday. Uh, sir, could we have your name and occupation, please? Yes, my name is Martin Levon. I'm an optometrist and sole owner of Levon's House of Lenses. And Levon's House of Lenses isn't uh, what you'd call a large or big business, is that right? No, it's a very small business. Mm -hmm. I don't even have the necessary uh, 20 feet to hang an eye chart. Oh, do you have an eye chart? Uh, yeah, the people who read my eye chart have to stand out in the street and read it through the door, which I keep open. Well, do you find this to be a satisfactory method? Well, it isn't bad. Sometimes a policeman comes along and arrests the person for standing on the sidewalk, mumbling with a hand clapped over one eye, but uh, <laughs> and that's the exception rather than the rule. <laughs> and uh, you've been waiting for that day, Mr. Levon, when you can afford to rent more spacious quarters, a place large enough to accommodate an eye chart. That's say. right, yes, sir. But that's not going to happen for some time because yesterday you were robbed of your life savings. Here's a picture of you in the paper. 
all tied up in front of your empty safe. That's me, all right. Mm -hmm. But the picture in the paper isn't the way it happened at all. Uh Actually, I was out having lunch across the street at the time. You say the pictorialization of the event is inaccurate, Mr. Levon? Sure. After I got back from lunch and found that I'd been robbed, I called the police. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty soon they came, and uh, so did a gang of newspaper photographers. And the photographer snapped your picture. Well, not until they, uh, they tied me up with a lot of rope and had me lie in front of the empty safe. Well, pictures like that are always good for newspaper circulation, Mr. Levon. That's the newspaper game. I don't think anybody was hurt by it. Well, I was. The photographer's left without bothering to undo the ropes. And with the door to your shop open, I imagine you attracted a lot of attention lying there in front of your safe all bound up. Well, it started with the neighborhood kids. They came in and severed the strings on my deaf perception machine. Of course, you couldn't kick them out or anything like that, what with being tied up and all. Well, that's right. And then a little while after that, a very regal-looking gentleman comes into the shop and made off with a pair of, uh, you know, pince-nez frames I've been working on. The pence was a little loose. You'd think that uh, passers-by would be more sympathetic, wouldn't you? You'd think so, wouldn't you? Anyway, before I got loose, my shop had been uh, really sacked by people. Incidentally, how did you get loose, Mr. Levon? Well, uh, one of the looters uh, dropped an eyeglass frame on the floor, and I kept uh, rubbing the ropes against it. It took a long time. Those eyeglass frames slide, you know. I certainly do know, Mr. Levon, and thank you for providing grist for the mill here on Faces in the News. <laughs> Now, let's return again to Garish Summit and its endless story of intrigue among the socially prominent. There, in stately splendor far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our action begins, wealthy dowager Agatha Murchfield is nervously flipping through the pages of a rare first edition in the solarium. She appears relieved when family attorney Bowden Pardew enters. Oh, do come in, Bowden. I'm relieved that you're here. I hope my urgent call didn't take you away from something more important. No, not at this hour, Agatha. I was merely sleeping. It's two o'clock in the morning, you know. Do tell. I had no idea. My watch is down at the jeweler. I always have them reset it for daylight time. Well, couldn't you avoid that inconvenience by just moving it up an hour yourself? Oh, I suppose I could get the hang of it, but since we have tradespeople to do those things, I prefer not to dirty my hands. Well, I guess well, it's one of the advantages of being extremely wealthy, eh? It's interesting you should mention that. Actually, I'm afraid I may soon be pitching camp at the poorhouse. We're going through rough times at the Merchfield Lead Company. Well, I am aware that the worldwide lead market is in a slump, Agatha, but I'm sure a woman like yourself with $5 billion in the bank can weather the storm. Well, I'm just not sure. I'd really like to economize before my bank balance starts to drop. That's why I called you here, Bowden. How much of a cut are you willing to take in the retainer I pay you? Well, I'd prefer not to see that figure reduced at all, Agatha. And I suppose calling you here at two in the morning has made you even more stubborn on that point? I think it may be a factor, yes. Well, then I guess I'll just have to cut my household budget, starting with the servant salaries. Well, you hardly pay them enough to live on now, Agatha. Well, I think it's quite adequate. Besides, they've been with me for years, and they worship the very ground I walk on. So I'm sure they'll sacrifice willingly once I've explained the situation. No offense intended, Mum. Now that you've explained the situation, how can I only say that I'll be packing to leave as soon as the sun comes up? Well, I hesitated to wake you in the middle of the night to tell you the bad news, Wilford, but I had no idea that depriving you of a little sleep would make you this grouchy. No offense intended, Mum, but it's not the sleep so much as you plan to reduce my wage. A $280 a month cut is substantial for a person who's only making 300 Well, you'll still get your meals free, and I don't plan to rent the vacant half of your room to an outsider, unless things get worse. Uh, No offense intended, Mum, but my room doesn't have a vacant half. It's only a small cell in the attic, barely wide enough for the folding cot you sold me. If I may say so, Mum, this whole thing hardly seems cricket for a woman who has five billion dollars in the bank. How in the world would you know the size of my bank account, Wilfred? Oh, it's common knowledge, Mum. 
Your ne'er-do-well son, Caldwell, keeps a chart of all your holdings posted on the wall of his room. He finds it useful in making his plans to wipe you out financially. Hey, just take a look at this chart before you get excited, Lefty. My old lady's got billions, so I figure my mark is good for a small $500,000 gambling debt. It ain't my decision, Merchfield. I get my orders from higher up, and Mr. Big's afraid the old lady's bankroll may run out before the lead market gets back on its feet. Nonsense. She's got enough to last for years. Just let me write a note to your boss explaining my solid financial position. Does Mr. Big spell his name with one G or two? Don't waste time writing letters, pal. You've got 24 hours to raise the half a mil, or I got orders to blow you away. Well, there's no need for alarm. I'll ask Mother for the 500000 just as soon as she's finished telling the butler about a salary cut. You better hope she comes across, buddy. Otherwise, it's curtains. Ken Caldwell make Agatha reach for her purse before Lefty reaches for his machine gun. Can Wilfred learn to find happiness on $20 a month? And what about the Middle Eastern potentate who's manipulating the lead market just to get Agatha upset? Perhaps we'll learn more next time when we hear the village jeweler say... I've finished setting your watch, Miss Agatha. But why have you come to call for it in the middle of the night? That's in the next exciting episode when we again return to Garish Summit. Well, now the big moment is at hand for all you listeners who hope to win a fortune in prizes by identifying our Bob and Ray mystery tune. We're going to uh, play a segment of a well-known popular song, and the first person to call in with its correct title will uh, qualify for a giant jackpot. And quite a jackpot it is, too. We failed to come up with a winner the last time we played our mystery tune, so that means the big prize has now grown to $18 in cash. But the money you can win is only part of it, friends. We also have some wonderful merchandise gifts donated by business people around the country. We're giving away a coupon good for the breakfast special at Rudy's House of Dry Toast in Moline, Illinois. Also a free pants cuffing job at the Delight Cleaners in Knoxville, Tennessee. And last but far from least... Two hours of skating lessons at the Funfest Rollerdrome in Providence, Rhode Island. And that's a whopping $30 worth of merchandise prizes that will be treasured by any of you who plan to travel soon to Moline, Knoxville, and Providence. Or if you're fortunate enough to already be in one of those cities, so much the better. So listen now to a portion of our mystery tune and be the first to call in when you're sure you can identify it. Paul? Okay, there it is. And our phone is still silent. So that means our giant jackpot will rise wait, next week. Wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute, Ray. I think we should give our listeners a little bit longer than that to get through to us with their calls. That I was... don't see why. I could have named it right off the bat. So if people out there can't collect their wits and call in, it's not our fault. Oh, well, <laughs> apparently somebody's wits have been collected because we have a call, so let's see if it's a winner. Hello? Hello? Hey, I'm sorry I took so long to call your special mystery tune number, but you didn't mention what it was over the air, so I accidentally called several other people first. Well, there's no need to apologize, sir. Just give us your answer. What? I said give us your answer. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm calling from the boiler factory where I work. The machinery makes an awful racket here. Well, can't you turn it off until you finish the call? No. Uh, I, look, I got another idea. I'll just turn off the machinery until we finish this call. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me better now? Well, I could hear you before, sir. You couldn't hear me. That was the only problem. What? I said I could hear you all right, but hey, you... Hey, listen, you don't have to speak up. They make us wear earplugs on the job so the noise won't damage our hearing, and the earplugs sure make it tough to carry on a phone conversation. Well, why don't you take them out so we can talk? What? Sir, I hate to say this, but we're on the air, and your problem is wasting too much time, so thanks anyway. Wait a anyway. minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I had to put down the phone to take out my earplugs, so I didn't hear what you said last. What was that again? Well, it may not have been important. Can you hear me now? Certainly. What can I do for you? Well, can you give us the title of our Bob and Ray mystery tune? That's what you called about, isn't it? Uh, yes, I thought you'd ever ask. Okay. The title of that tune is The Star Spangled Banner. No, I'm sorry, sir. In fact, I don't know why you made a guess like that. It didn't sound anything like The Star Spangled Banner. Well, I don't know what it sounded like. It's impossible to hear a radio in a boiler factory, but I saw some guys uh, through the glass partition standing at attention. 
So I figured you were playing the Star Spangled Banner. No, they were probably standing up for some other reason. Yeah, maybe it was the start of a fire drill. Could I be. see they've all run out of the building now, but yeah. uh, I, I didn't hear the alarm. Well, I'm sure you didn't, but thanks for calling. And due to your failure, our giant jackpot will grow to $21 next week when we again search for a winner in our Bob and Ray Mystery Tune Contest. <laughs> No, nah, I think I'll uh, I'll run up to Washington Heights. That's uh, where I live. <laughs> hey, suit yourself. We've got to go anyway. The program today was, as usual, developed and produced by Larry Josephson for the Radio Foundation with the help of associate producer Lars Howell. Uh, Paul Taubman provided the music, Al Schaefer the sound effects, and the technical director was David Glasser. Our engineers are Howard Schwartz and David Glasser, assisted by Marty Newman and Miles Smith. And production assistants Bill O'Neill and Charles Whitson. And a bulletin just handed me says that funding for yet another Bob and Ray program has just been arranged, so we will be here next time. Thanks in part to funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through NPR's Satellite Program Development Fund. And now this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. Additional funding from public radio stations. For a free picture of Bob and Ray, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. Again, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Bob and Ray Picture, Box 5000 GPO, New York 10116. We regret that we cannot send a picture without a stamped, self-addressed envelope. This program was independently produced by the Radio Foundation.